Today's class, we're just going to continue on with cyclones, and we should be able to finish this topic uh, today. Then tomorrow, there's a filtration section that begins, and uh, we'll actually have a different lecture for that tomorrow. I'll be here, but um, we'll, we'll, I'll introduce the lecture tomorrow, and uh, we'll start the filtration topic, which then leads into the membrane section. So let's just uh, recap where we were yesterday. We were looking at, at um, cyclones, and we said that and we were discussing the various forces that act on these particles. It's something that takes a little bit of getting used to, and it definitely helps if you can visualize in three dimensions what's going on. We have velocities in the axial direction, which is up top to bottom direction, and the velocity is positive in the upper direction. All these particles, the small particles, that get trapped in that inner vortex. And we have, in fact, a protrusion into the cyclone, which is called the vortex finder, to, to, to take those particles out and out of the overflow. We also have a velocity, then, that are negative. And we see them close to the wall. So as we get closer to the cyclone's wall, the velocities in this axial direction are, are very much down. So they're spiraling in a downwards direction. There's also this radial component. Now that's very, very small. Compared to this vertical velocity and compared to the tangential velocity, the radial direction really doesn't um, matter too much. And then the tangential direction is by far one of the greater velocities, and that's proportional. Um, we have the velocity multiplied by the distance from the center raised to a constant n. That constant n is roughly 1, uh, and sometimes it's, it's about 0.8. But the key then is that the product of those two gets you a constant, indicating that velocities actually get, from the tangential perspective, are slower at larger radius. So if we look at that, that velocity profile, as we, our radius gets larger and larger, the velocity drops off. And then notice here, I didn't point this out last class, but there's a sudden drop there right at the wall. Okay? So that tangential velocity drops right off at the wall uh, due to the boundary layer effect and that friction of the particle against the wall. Okay, so we can see that again in another video that I didn't show last time that I, I would, would like to just take a look at. Uh, we'll just look at the initial part. Um, just pause it here. So we've got a grouping of, of particles. Again, these simulations, as I said last time, the, the researchers in this area take a whole number of particles in the tens of thousands, and they simulate each particle's x, y, and z motion individually. So that's why there's always a finite number, just because of computer memory constraints. They'll simulate them and model the first principles Navier-Stokes equations. So notice then, when this particle start moving, we've got this rectangular inlet coming in, and those particles enter with a given tangential velocity. So that's the initial conditions. And notice the pattern of the particles, especially those closest to the wall. So there's an initial acceleration, and then there's slowing down at the wall, but they are traveling much slower than the particles inside. Okay? We have our two vortices set up, our outer one and our inner. There's this vortex finder that then pulls the smaller particles out and takes them what you call the overflow stream. Then down here at the bottom, we have what's called the underflow. These particles leaving are the ones that are not entrained by uh, the vortex. They're essentially, they've been slowed down to a small velocity. These would be your larger particles. Now, one thing to, to understand about the cyclone, and it's, this is the critical variable that we have to play with, is this inner vortex being formed goes all the way to about this point. So that inner vortex is rotating, and we've got our outer vortex here. So we can imagine the particles in this region, they're the ones right at that point where they're either deciding they're going to go down to the bottom, well, the particles decide, but the forces on it is going to determine whether that particle reports to the underflow or the overflow. So this region over here, the, the balance of forces in this tapered point just before the underflow is, is where there's some critical behavior occurring. Right? And it's no surprise in that our key degree of freedom that we have to adjust the cyclone's operation is the diameter of that particle. That's what we play with. And newer cyclones are manufactured so that that diameter is variable. We 
we can adjust that outlet diameter, and that's going to determine the efficiency of the cycle and how, how well it performs. So we're going to see a bit of that uh, modeling and, and analysis in today's class. But uh, that's one key variable that, that uh, people will use. The other variable that, that uh, one can determine the cyclone's efficiency is the inlet volumetric flow rate Q. So that feed rate of material coming through uh, the cyclone is critical. So what, what companies will do then is to get the desired level of separation between small and large particles, small particles leaving in the overflow, large particles leaving in the underflow, is they'll actually have banks of parallel cyclones. So the moment you have one cyclone, you've got a very high volumetric flow rate through it, you'll see in today's class that that may not get you the desired separation between small and large particles. So we split our stream in half and then go through two parallel cyclones. So now the volumetric flow rate <coughs> is reduced and it changes the operational characteristics of the cyclone. We can go to three or four cyclones in parallel and as we change that volumetric flow rate, we alter the size of the particles leaving at the top and back in the underflow. Okay, so that's the, that's the key variable uh, to, to adjust is that volumetric flow rate as well as the, the excess of the band. Now, last uh, class we, we, we ended off at this slide, and I'll just uh, touch on it briefly again. The key mechanism that particles are leaving here is not due to gravity pulling them out of the bottom. Uh, gravity doesn't really play a role, especially for small cyclones. It's only on the very, very large cyclones, which are operating at much slower um, velocities, that gravity's role actually does play somewhat of an effect. But in general, gravity is not the reason why particles are leaving in the underflow. Um, it's because of that slower velocity at the wall near the exit, or that's another term for it. Spirit. So what will happen is that our density particles will move selectively towards the wall, they get slowed down, and then they drop out um, out of that cyclone. So there's a balance of resonance times required. So we, the velocity and the volumetric flow rate coming in are manipulated in such a way to get that residence time. If, we, if we're forcing a very high um, Q volumetric flow rate into the cyclone, all we're going to do is simply just blow our particles out of the top and the bottom. Right? We're not going to get an efficient separation. That residence time needs to be such that we get the particles able to set up their stable orbits in those radial and tangential directions, and then they'll, they'll find their way either to the overflow or the underflow. So, so controlling that residence time, or in other words, controlling the volumetric flow rate Q is, um, is the critical area. One way that people also visualize or understand cyclones, and you'll see this if, you, if you're interested in going to more of the theoretical concepts of cyclones, is they simply call a cyclone a, a sophisticated elutriation device. So remember we had said in one of the previous classes that elutriation is if you've got a particle settling in a fluid and then I flow the fluid upwards in the opposite direction, I can balance that fluid flow velocity with the particle's velocity. I can get that particle to actually stabilize at the point. So the device that does that is called an elutriator. A cyclone is nothing more than a sophisticated elutriator where we're balancing the forces on that particle. But now we're not going up and down direction, we're now talking in radial direction. Okay, so there is an elucidation concept in, in cyclones as well, if you're modeling it from those principles. So the main focus of today's class, however, is understanding how we can evaluate a cyclone's performance. And then once we have a mechanism to evaluate its performance, <coughs> we can then go look at the variables we can adjust to manipulate performance as required. Or, Conversely, if we've got a cyclone operating and it's not giving us the desired performance, how can we get it towards the direct, uh, move it towards the direction we require? So here's how we consider cyclones. Particle size distribution. Okay, we know that our feed never has a single diameter of particle. We don't have one diameter DP coming in. We have a, a spread of particle diameters. So here's a, here's a hypothetical feed 
it's with a, with a heavy tail on the smaller particle diameters and larger, the, the, the long tail adds to high diameter. So very few large diameter particles, many small diameter particles coming in as my feed, the mass flow of my feed, kilograms per second is capital M. That feed then gets split out into what we call our overflow or underflow, or other terms you'll sometimes see as the fine and the coarse. Okay? So those are two acceptable alternatives, fine and coarse stream, overflow, underflow. Please don't use the terminology top and bottom for the exit and, and, and in, the, in the overflow of the underflow stream because of the fact that we can actually hurry the cyclone in, uh, in a horizontal direction, for example. So that terminology should not be used. So fine and coarse, or overflow and underflow. So let's work with this. The fine streams then will have a greater percentage smaller particles now, and then almost no large coarse or large part diameter particles. The coarse stream is the opposite and will sum up so that the coarse stream's mass plus the fine stream's mass flow equals the feed stream. So that overall mass balance in kilograms per second must hold. Or um, if you take a sample of the feed stream and the coarse and the fine stream, we can perform a mass balance on them. And we can also perform a mass balance within each size fraction. Okay, so for a given particle size in the feed, I can find the feed percentage, or I should say kilograms of mass within a given bin on that histogram. To find the mass within a given bin, and it must sum up to the fines plus the course for the same bin. For the case where obviously steady state operations, so in cyclones, we definitely don't have accumulation. If you've got accumulation, you've got a problem. Okay. So for regular steady state operation, let's take a bin, for example, the 10 micrometer bin. The mass of feed in the 10 micrometer bin must add up to the mass of fines in the 10 micrometer bin plus the mass of course in the 10 micrometer. So within each size fraction, as well as the overall mass balance, uh, must equate. So then what we do is we can evaluate uh, two numbers. One is less useful than the other. The first one that's easier to measure and, and calculate is the total efficiency. So let's just take a look at how that's defined. It simply says take the mass reporting into your underflow divided by the mass of feed. So mass leaving in the underflow in the coarse stream divided by the total feed mass gives you your efficiency. So at the zero, if a cyclone is 100% efficient, then it's saying all your mass is going to the underflow, to the coarse stream. And your overflow stream is essentially air or fluid. So that, that's a 100% efficient cycle. All your mass leaves in the core stream. You've totally separated your solids from your, from your uh, fluid phase. Okay, so a separation factor would be one, uh, would be infinite in that case, for 100% efficient in this situation. All my mass is reporting to the underflow in the core stream. The 0% efficient cycle would be very unusual, and, and that's where you're sending all your mass into the overflow, into the fines. So that's the two extremes of the number, and we would have all sorts of numbers in between. What's a good range? What is a good range? Yeah. There isn't a good range. We'll, we'll talk about that now. Uh, we'll actually judge our, our performance actually based on this great efficiency. There's, we can't answer that. How is that uh, efficient separation and everything so we to the underflow? Why is it an efficient separation, 100% efficient? Everything's going to the underflow because with cyclones, our usual objective is complete separation of the solid phase from the fluid phase. So, especially in the context of dust collection, you want to, you've got a dust stream that you don't want to go pollute your neighbors with, so you pass it through a cyclone first and you wish to collect all the mass out. Uh, in cyclones, in that situation, very often that mass is extremely valuable. So those solids are desirable, and you wish to recover 100% of it in the fluid phase, usually of no value to you, usually. Does any fluid come through 
Does any fluid come through the anode? Yes. Um, so this is where it, this wouldn't balance, right? So when you've got fluid coming through your underflow, that means your mass, of course, um, cannot equal m. But uh, I guess we're, we're okay. I see. Okay, so we're going. You, this is a solids balance. So we're doing a balance on solids. So m c and m are referring to the mass of solids, not the fluid. So we're not referring to. So in that case, yes, NC would equal M, and you, you don't account for your fluid. There would be fluid, obviously, leaving in overflow and underflow. Okay. Okay, what's more useful, though, is the grade efficiency, because this is just a single number. The grade efficiency now is, in fact, a curve itself. We calculate a curve and judge the, the ability of the separator based on this grade efficiency curve. The way it works is it's we calculate the curve at different size fractions x. So what we're going to do is we're going to end up with a graph that looks something like this. This is called g of x. And I'm going to have x, which is equal to my size fraction. Yeah, and that's measured in microns in this column. So what we're going to say is we're just going to pick a value of size fraction. Let's take 5 microns. As an example, find the mass, the find the fraction of size of five microns in the core stream. So, what percentage of my material leaving in the core stream? What percentage of material in the core stream is five microns? Multiply that by the mass flow of the core stream. That's my numerator. My denominator then is the total mass of 5 microns that came in, that percentage, multiplied by the mass flow. So it's a ratio of the what's reporting to the core stream divided by what's entering my cyclone in the feed. Okay, so there's my mixed feed, and we're simply taking the ratio of those, those masses. We'll, we'll calculate that for each particle size. So I can do that for 5 microns, 10 microns, so forth, and then I generate this G of X diagram. So when we plot G of X here, you'll see in the next few slides, we show that they're smooth curves. But in fact, as you would imagine, we, we're not able to calculate a smooth curve. We have discrete size distributions from our seeds, our screens that we use in the lab. So we do lab tests for this. Collect a sample of the feed, collect a sample of the course, collect a sample of the fines, and we use those those masses and those histograms to calculate this. So it's actually a discrete curve, but we plot it as a smooth S-shaped curve usually. So let's just uh, just quickly recap again, and this is this is obviously in the second assignment. When we plot these diagrams f of x, lower, lowercase f of x, we're simply getting a diagram that tells us a percentage of the distribution in each size fraction. So here, for example, I may have been 10 micron bin, that area is proportional to how much material of size fraction 10 microns is in my particular stream. So I'll, I'm simply taking the ratio of, of these and calculating this G of X. So that G of X curve will look, uh, will look something like that. Let's understand why it's S-shaped quick. Um, if we just unpack this formula, imagine a, a very large particle size, okay, so a large particle size coming in my feed, that large particle diameter should mostly leave out in the core stream. I shouldn't see large particles leaving in my fines. Okay, so a large particle size <coughs> fraction in the numerator will be a large value multiplied by the mass flow in the core stream. And the numerator here should be the same value or close to the same value as what's in the denominator, which is the mass of that same part, large particle coming in in the feed. So if all my large particles are the same comes in my feed, that's the denominator, and all those same large particles, that same total mass will report out into my core stream. So at large size values, large uh, diameter particles, we should get GXs that approach 1. So we should see those values numerically close to 1, 0.95s, 0.99s, as we get up to higher, higher and higher 
particle sizes. <laughs> then conversely, as we drop off to lower particle size diameters, these smaller particles will preferentially leave in the fines or in the overflow. And so that numerator term will be close to zero. So as we get to smaller and smaller particles, G of X should drop off close to zero. The number that we use from this curve is g of x equal to 0.5. So a useful thing <coughs> is let's read horizontally at 0.5 and then find this value on the x-axis. We'll call this x50. Okay. It's a special name we give for the particular size diameter of particle where g of x is 0.5. G of x is 0.5 interpretation means that half your mass at that size fraction is leaving in the overflow and the other half is leaving in the underflow. So at g of x equal to 0.5, for that given particle diameter, this x50 diameter, whatever it might be in microns, particles of that size, half of them are leaving in the overflow, half of them are leaving in the underflow. And so we call that our cut size. It's essentially where we're cutting it in half. So that number is a useful way to summarize this curve. So we have a curve g of x, and what we do is we find that value, x50, and that number <coughs> is what we then use to report the efficiency of the sum. Yes. So if you want really high particle removal, you want your uh, g of x, x50 to be Right, so the question is being asked, if you want high particle removal, so most of your particles taken out, you want what you want your G of X curve to look like. Okay. So we're going to actually ask it the other way around when we understand the cyclones. We're going to say, this particular cyclone produces a G of X curve that looks like this. Is this cyclone suitable for my application? Okay, so we're actually... We're going to then characterize our cyclones by the G of X curve that they produce. And if that G of X curve is suitable, we're going to take it and, and use that cyclone. So let's, uh, let's take, the, take a concrete example then. If I put some numbers on this axis. So here's 50, 40, 30, 20, and 10. So here's a cyclone that produces X, X 50. This cyclone has an X50 of 18 microns. I have particles and I want to guarantee that the stream that I believe I'm sending out into the atmosphere, say it's a dust collection application, has dust particles that are, are 30 microns or lower are acceptable to, to send to the atmosphere. So it's quite okay to bend particles that are 30 microns or smaller to the atmosphere. Would the cyclone be suitable? Yeah? This side of the class doesn't seem to, to agree at all. Can you repeat the question, please? Okay, so I'm asking, here's a cyclone, that's its G of X curve. Will the cyclone be suitable for my application if my requirement is that the government says it's okay for you to bend particles that are 30 microns or smaller to the atmosphere, but not, not particles larger than that. Okay. So this icon may be suitable because at 30 microns, we'll see that we'll get the G of X of about 0.8. We're going to recover about 80% of the particles that are 30 microns. Now, if I had available to me a different cyclone for not for like about the same amount of cost, but its G of X curve was like that. Is that a better cyclone? Yeah. 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 Okay. So because that's going to then pull out the great percentage of the thing. So that's how we use these 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 curves. Yeah. What's the significance of the of the X It's simply just the the point where G of X is 0.5. And the interpretation of G of X 0.5 is the, mid, the cut point where particles of that size, half of them will go to the overflow, and particles of that same size, half of them will go to the underflow. 
So it's one and that's one yellow and it's one. Yeah. So if you get a G of x equal to one, you're getting 100% particles of that size reporting to your course stream. And you should have no particles of that size getting to your So in other words, here where, where G of x reaches one means that's about the largest particle size we should ever expect in the universe. <coughs> so at this point where G of x reaches one, we should just start to see particles of that size, 30 microns, in the overflow. But for the most part, we should never, well, most of them will report to the underflow. Yeah. If you do have, if you do have dust in your feet and all of it is going into the um, underflow, but it's still with the, um, you still have to do like other separations. Okay, so uh, if it's going to your overflow or your underflow? Well, your underflow, because say that you want to, you want to get the, you want to get the dust out of your, um, out of your fluid, yeah. but you also have fluid going into the underflow. So is it, is it an improvement because there's like less fluid going through dust particles? We're usually not concerned about how much fluid goes in the overflow and underflow because it's usually oh. air is the carrying the yeah. okay. So we're usually not interested in recovering our fluid. <laughs> We, we don't make consideration for that. Yeah. Okay, so, so here's what actually what we discussed. We were looking at different G of X curves, and it's clear that, that as that curve moves over here, we're getting more desirable separation from the particle size distribution. Okay, so, so that's how we interpret it. Now, let's take a look at how we operate these cyclones, what characteristics we look at. Uh, one important factor is the pressure drop because that's going to indicate our cost of the cycle. And the pressure drop is proportional, as we'll see in a minute, to the velocity of the inlet squared. So higher velocities coming in, greater pressure drops. The other way that we can manipulate the delta P is by adjusting the diameter of the underflow. And that's an inverse relationship. So if we open up that diameter, delta P will drop. If we close the diameter, delta P. So that's, uh, that's an important consideration. And the, in general, what we find is that our efficiency of our cyclone will drop off at very high solids concentration. So the more solids there are in your, in your feed, the less efficiently you can, um, you can remove them. So what some people often do is because the carrier is a fluid, is air, uh, they'll simply just inject extra air in to dilute that suspension coming in. OK. so. What I'd like to look at next is a bit on how, oh, there's one more slide before we look at uh, One, I think we've covered most of these before, right? So it's uh, cheap to build these cyclones. They cost about nothing more than $10,000 for the market size cyclones. So they're, they're very cheap to, to buy and install. Uh, they can be used in any orientation. The other thing is that's, that's interesting is that once you've bought one of these, they'll often be reused in different contexts. contexts. Uh, so companies will, We'll recycle them and reuse them in different, um, different feed streams. There are some disadvantages, though, is that you can imagine with that main separation being due to change in velocities, especially at the wall, that <coughs> particles are going to abrade the internal um, material. So those the cyclones can wear out on very abrasive feed. Um, also, we cannot really use them if we've flocculated our feet because the high shear forces coming in on that tangential axis will break those flocks up. And then the other key, key constraint here is that when we have um, these cyclones operating, they work really well if we can stabilize the volumetric feed flow rate Q. So for, for situations where you cannot guarantee a constant feed volumetric flow rate, the, the approach is simply to take many cyclones and put them in parallel and then close the valves for those that are not needed. And as your volumetric feed requirement goes up, you open the valves and bring more cyclones online. So that you keep the ones that are operating um, at, at a stable volumetric feed. So let's take a look now and understand what, how we can quantify the operation in a cyclone. The main number that we use is the Euler number. So the Euler number is defined as the ratio of pressure forces over inertial forces. This is a number that you're, you're comfortable with from the fluid flow course, which simply tells you if you move particle through a pipe, how much of the pressure force that you put in to move the fluid 
uh, gets translated over into velocity. So delta P is equal to the Euler number times the density times velocity squared. So if you're in the ideal frictionless case, we recall from fluid flow the Euler number of one is the is a perfect height with no friction. So it simply says that all the energy you put into delta P, you recover in increased velocity. But we know that we, that's a, such an idealistic situation, we never achieve that. So that ratio, actually the Euler number is a number greater than one, indicating that we have losses. We don't get to convert all our delta P into velocity. And for, for cyclones, those numbers are easily in the order of a thousand. There's, there's significant losses. But what this equation does tell us is that delta P is proportional to that velocity squared. Now the velocity that we're interested in in the cyclone isn't not the entry or the exit velocity. It's a characteristic velocity that's characteristic of the internal velocity experienced in the cyclone. So here's my cyclone, the cylindrical portion. Here's a diameter D psych here. That's the diameter of the cyclone. And if we use the standard formula uh, for cross-sectional area and volume <coughs> flow rate, we can calculate the velocity that's characteristic of the cyclone, and that's that one shown up over here. So the velocity we should use is four times the volumetric feed flow rate divided by pi times the cyclone internal cylindrical diameter. That's the velocity we use up here in the Euler equation. So, easy to calculate the Euler number. Let's uh, talk about that for a second. The Euler number, once we have it for a cyclone, stays that. For a given cyclone, for moderate conditions of, of, um, of feed concentrations, the cyclone's Euler number stays relatively constant. It will change in very high solids loading, but for the situations we're considering here with moderate solids concentration, of around one gram per meter cubed, that Euler number will stay. Even if you operate it at higher velocities or lower volumetric flow rates, so high Q, low Q, high, um, high delta P, low delta P, high velocity, low velocity, if you alter the cyclone's inlet and outlet conditions, the Euler number still remains fixed. So the Euler number is a good number that's characteristic of the cyclone itself. So you can often purchase cyclones that way. You can purchase a cyclone with a given Euler number, and the vendor will be able to provide you with the Euler number that is for the cyclone. We can also easily go calculate it. If I feed a clean air stream into that cyclone, so no solids, I can easily calculate delta P. I can go easily calculate rho F. I know that. In fact, V I had from the prior equation which is full. So for a given cyclone, I can easily calculate that velocity. I can go calculate the cyclone's Euler number if I don't have it. You walk into a company, no one knows who purchased the cyclone or where the documentation is for it. You can easily, easily get the Euler number. And if you go, you can approximate it using this very crude um, formula that will give you a good ballpark figure. So Euler numbers, characteristic of the cyclone. That's, that's the important first step. The next important step is there's the Stokes number. Similar in principle in that it stays fairly constant for, for a cyclone. Okay, and the Stokes number looks characteristic of Stokes law, which is exactly what it is. So if we've taken Stokes law and rearranged it to make it dimensionless. So what we get then is this formula that's appropriate for use in a cyclone. But what we've done is we've then instead of remember Stokes law requires us to know the particle diameter. Well, let's not use a, a particular particle diameter because it doesn't make sense. But let's take this value off that grade efficiency curve x50 and use that instead. So that grade efficiency x50 is then used in, instead of the of a diameter. So let's use the cut point diameter. The rest of the terms have their usual meaning the density of solids, the velocity that's characteristic of the cyclone, which we saw earlier, the viscosity of the fluid, and then the diameter of the cyclone. So that's my Stokes number for a, for a given cyclone. 
And I can actually use that because, of, again, like I said, like the Euler number, the Stokes number, once we know it, it's constant for the cyclone. I can go use that then quite interestingly in the following manner. For a given Stokes number, we have 18 uf times the diameter of the cyclone is equal to Stokes number. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. That's equal to x50 squared times the density of the solids times the velocity. So for a given feed stream, I know the viscosity of my feed. I know the diameter of my cyclone. The Stokes number I know. That's the number that I find interesting. This is rho s is the number I know for my solids, and then velocity is a characteristic of my cyclone. Uh, sorry, is, is a number I can adjust. Right? I can adjust that velocity by adjusting the flow rate, flow rate q going into the cyclone. So recall then uh, Okay, so for a given fluid stream that we have to treat, we know these parameters. I can now see how I can trade off the velocity, i.e. this volumetric flow rate q, okay, because that's really what velocity is, is how what volumetric feed flow rate I, I send into the cyclone. I can trade that off and predict what the cut size is. Okay, so that's where this equation is really, really powerful. And once I have that velocity that I specify, I can also go back and use it in this formula for the Euler number to go calculate delta P. So I can then go measure, so I can get Euler, multiply it by that velocity, and predict what my pressure drop is. And that way I can then estimate the utility consumption for moving this material through that cycle. So my cost of my lower or my motor to get this uh, separation. Okay, so these two parameters are, are really important for cyclone characterization and performance analysis. So here's how I'd like to end off this section. And let's, uh, let's work through this conceptual example. Again, this is like the previous uh, centrifuge example in that we're not really able to solve this quickly here in class. So let's not put any numbers into this process. Let's simply plan our strategy to solve this, and then I'll leave you to, to work through the calculations at home. So here's the, here's the problem. We're facing the need to treat a certain flow rate Q, capital Q, of that much, 0.177 of the and then there we know all sorts of properties regarding the feed. Um, we've got those, those pressure drops that we require, these uh, densities and viscosities. But we have this need where delta P is 1650 pascals, and we require a cut size of 0.8 microns. In the cyclone, uh, so the way we can purchase cyclones is we usually purchase from a family of cyclones in a, from a catalog. We can purchase cyclones which have that Euler number and that Stokes number. And what we can do then is once we have that, we can then calculate the diameter of the cyclone, which is exactly what we're going to, to, to look at here. So for this set of requirements to treat that feed stream, plan your approach on how you would calculate the number of cyclones you need as well as the diameter of those cyclones. So I, I'll tell you here right away, if we use just a single cyclone and send all that volumetric feed through it, what you'll find is that the first thing, the pressure drop will be too high because you're not, your, your velocity coming in is so great that your delta P is so high. So what I mean by that is that velocity there would be too great to, to get uh, the required delta P. So what we'll do is we'll take our feed and we'll split it into a number of streams and send each of these streams to a different cyclone. So each feed then goes to a different cyclone, and then we'll collect the overflows, and we'll collect the underflows, and then 
recombine them again. So this is a standard strategy that we use, is split our feeds. And the moment we split that, we're now sending less Q to each cyclone. So then, then we start to get greater efficiency in the cyclone. We're able to achieve that particle band. So what I'd like to do is just prove to yourself that you can do that. Um, well, let's, let me rephrase it. What I'd like to do is plan your strategy. Let's, let's outline an approach where if we take these given numbers and that Q, calculate how you can split it out, and then what the corresponding cut size is going to be. We're requiring 0 0.08. So essentially calculate what your cut size will be for one cyclone, for two cyclones, three, four, five. And you'll see that your cut size will improve and get towards that target the more cyclones you have. So we've got a few minutes here to end of the class. Um, and we'll, I, I'll give you a few minutes to work through it, and then we'll outline the strategy on the board.
let's take a look at what will happen. If this Q, if I use more cyclones, Q is going to drop. So I'm going to get lower volumetric feed flow rate. Q drops. How about delta P just like delta? Delta P is fixed. We would like to operate this for a given delta P. So in fact, if we look at this equation for a given delta P, for a given oil number, for a given fluid density, V is in fact a fixed number. So V is fixed. So if I have two cyclones, three cyclones, four cyclones, it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. V is fixed. So if Q drops, what's going to happen to D cyclone? It's going to also drop because that V must remain constant. So if D cyclone drops, what's going to happen to my cut size band? Okay, it's going to drop by a huge amount because of this quadratic effect in the linear effect. So this D cyclone appears over here and cut size appears here. So no, I should, that's totally wrong, but I just wrote that. It's going to drop to the square root. So if we look at that portion, the D cyclone, there's some constant alpha here is equal to x50 squared. So the x50 is going to change to the square root of that. So moderate, we're not going to see dramatic effects. I'm going to have to change the diameter quite substantially in order to get this point. So work through that and you can prove these answers to yourself. And there's also a spreadsheet on the course website to 